Uh, I would like to uh, welcome again people here and people online for the last session of today. I think that, well, before we planned the conference, of course, this was not uh, any topic for us, but uh, even not the topic for people who were preparing their presentations and workshops. But of course, we understood that uh, after the corona situation or during the corona situation, we need to uh, approach it and know more about it. And I think that the whole conference has been uh, talking about different aspects of teaching learning languages. And I think that very important uh, moment is also the policies around or the institutions that work across Europe or, uh, well, across nations or simply that uh, cover uh, wider groups than just our universities. So we have here four panelists who are going to discuss the uh, corona times and then the impact or the changes. And uh, so let me introduce uh, here in person uh, Sabina Schaffner, who is uh, president of Circles and at the same time director of the Language Center at uh, Zurich University in ETH. Then uh, Anne Chateau from the University of Nancy, who is uh, general secretary of Circles. Then uh, Sarah Breslin, who is uh, uh, director of the European Center of Modern Languages, uh, which is based in Graz in Austria, and uh, Maria Teresa Fanola, who is uh, director of European Language Council and professor at Università Cattolica in Milano. So uh, these four ladies, they are now going to tell us where, what is their context actually, where they come from in general in the middle of this, and uh, then we will take a look at three areas or more areas of uh, our lives that have been so heavily uh, impacted by, by this situation. Okay, so if you want to start, Sabina, uh, with the microphone. With the microphone please. Of course, uh, so I'm having two hats. So if I put on my first hat, I'm the director of a language center, of the biggest language center in Switzerland and uh, we are serving students of two universities, which also in Corona time doesn't make life easier. Um, and uh, of course, we, as everybody, we have been affected in the language center very directly by the Corona situation. My other hat is um, the hat of the Circles uh, president. And of course, also Circles is not only at this conference, but also with regard to its future, uh, future activities directly uh, concerned by the current situation. You could say a Corona crisis or the Corona chance. And um, yes, it's also a topic we are following up with our coordinating committee and our members. Okay, thank you. Anne Chateau. Yes, thank you. Um, I currently work at uh, the University of Lorraine, in oh, fact. Sorry. No, but uh, I'm sure we don't have many people in Lorraine watching us, and uh, because there's always a sort of war between the two main cities in okay. Lorraine. So the university, in fact, gathers all the students from Metz and Nancy, which are the two main cities in Lorraine. But anyway, okay. um, I work at, the, at what is called the UFR Landsab, which is Unité de Formation et de Recherche, which means more or less the language center, which provides language learning provisions for the student of the University of Lorraine. And that represents approximately 60,000 students. Um, I've been at the, I was at the head of that language center for five years until September 2019, where uh, most of the language programs are based on trying to develop students' autonomy, providing training to develop students' autonomy. Uh, for all students in Lorraine, at least one language is compulsory in the studies. And for some of them, uh, there are two languages. I've also been involved in RANACLES, which is the French uh, Language Center Associations, for approximately 15 years. And I've been the treasurer for eight years. And finally, uh, just like Sabina, I have many uh, hats. 
Um, I, I'm, I've been the Secretary General of Cyprus for approximately one year, almost one year. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah? Um, yes, uh, good evening everyone and uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me to take part in this, this panel discussion. Um, you may be wondering why the ECML is here. Um, we're not a member institution um, of, of CERCLA, but we're not a language, uh, university language centre either. But let me just explain. The ECML is the European Centre for Modern Languages and it's part of something much bigger. It's part of the, the Council of Europe, which is Europe's largest intergovernmental governmental institution, um, which is really founded on three pillars, democracy, human rights, and, and the rule of law. And it has a very long tradition of working in the field of language education, going back to the, to the 1960s. Um, firstly, in, in the field of foreign languages, but gradually broadening out um, to cover the languages of, of schooling, regional minority languages, all languages, in fact, and, and this concept of plurilingual and intercultural education education. And even if you're not familiar with either the Council of Europe directly or the ECML, I'm sure you're all very familiar with tools like the CEFR um, or more recently the, the CEFR companion volume. These were developed by the Council of Europe um, in Strasbourg. And in the companion volume, there's this interesting notion of, of mediation that that's, was there in the CEFR and has been further developed. And in some ways, I think it's quite a good image for the ECML. Um, we kind of act as a, a European mediator in the field of, of language education um, across geographic Europe um, and across sectors and, and across uh, languages. And the direct link to, to CERCLA is that as part of the ECML, we have a professional network forum where we ask um, INGOs working in the field of language education to share their expertise with us. Um, and they all very kindly agree to do so. Um, and CERCLA is one of the, the member institutions of uh, the ECML Professional Network Forum. So um, that's why I'm here today and uh, I'm delighted to be so. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Maria Teresa? Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. And I think that it's the first panel we have in Europe, at least, about this, the fact how we react, we have reacted in this uh, sanitary crisis. Um, my, I'm, I'm the president of the Conseil Européen pour les Langues, European Language Council. Uh, which is an association that brings, um, that brings together representatives from European Commission, European Parliament, the Council of Europe, and above all, European institutions of higher education. And we are um, concerned, above all, with language policy in higher education, and uh, we have been concerned in these uh, subjects uh, during um, almost more than 20 years, and we followed this, th this subject uh, in European projects. Uh, and so now we, we wonder really how to um, examine all this uh, situation. And we have uh, in connection with the uh, circle because uh, in relationship with, because uh, of the memorandum of understanding of cooperation we have, and uh, with ES ECML as well. So mm, I think this is uh, uh, a great chance to have a moment where we can exchange our opinion in, in, in a moment as well that implies uh, a change of, uh, of mind and new solutions for the, uh, all these new situations. At the same time, I am director of the language center of my university in Italy. Uh, Università Cattolica, and the principal siege is Milan, but uh, it's a peculiar language center because we have uh, other um, departments in other towns in Italy. So it's quite a, a composed language centers because we have in Rome, Piacenza, Brescia, Cremona, and Milan. So it's different towns, different uh, organization. And that allows me to have uh, the um, quite an horizon that can be interesting and I, I hope to be uh, to have uh, some 
um, some ideas to, to share with you this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, we have here people who operate on many levels, and it means that uh, it can give them the, uh, well, uh, maybe a better idea of what was going on, what we could see as individuals in our language centers or universities, and once you cover much larger associations, you can actually see uh, many different things. So that's why this discussion is not going to be about uh, individual, I don't know, methodologies or tools or anything that uh, we all as language teachers or language practitioners uh, know or would like to know about, but this will be more about more on the level of the policies on all the approaches to how to deal with that situations in general. So uh, we have identified three areas at the beginning, but of course uh, these will develop into a wider discussion. And the first one that uh, we'd like to address is uh, how was the COVID situation affected or how has the COVID situation affected the work of your institution? And now, as I'm saying, this is not institution as one language center, but this is a European association or national association or uh, institution that uh, covers more institutions from different countries. So definitely that will be an interesting uh, look at the thing. I don't know whether, is there anybody who would like to start? Because it's difficult to choose as, as the, the aspect will be very different. So. Yep, okay, Sabina, thank you. Uh, microphone. <laughs> uh, still talking about our language center, but in a more, taking it as an example, I would say I would like to start using a metaphor, and it's perhaps a Swiss metaphor. So I feel that like in spring uh, of this year, it was like a snowstorm which affected us, and we did not expect it, um, or only very late. And then you struggle very hard, and in the end you struggle, struggle successfully. You do not only survive the avalanche, but adapt more easily than expected. There are some losses and minor injuries, and at the end of the term you are exhausted and proud to have managed and happy about positive moments with students and peers, this can be seen in our language center with a lot of awards we got, which are high over the average of uh, the University of Zurich. It can be seen at other language centers from what I learned. So um, surveys say, uh, saying always that language centers teaching staff did very well in comparison with other university academic staff in coping with the crisis on a teaching level. And uh, I think that uh, it, it does, without uh, touching upon the next question, we are now after the avalanche, but we are still not in a very quiet uh, weather situation. It's insecure, we have learned things, and we are, have to be prepared for the upcoming um, months. Um, yes, as for the future, we will talk later, but it is also something which uh, concerns us um, with circles and also from a circles and language center direct uh, perspective, I would say that I agree with the widespread opinion about the digital learning booster. We have also heard it today in one of the uh, panels, um, keynotes, that the corona crisis has enabled. This is really something we shouldn't underestimate. But I also think at the same time that as language center responsibles, we also have to critically assess the loss, both on a social, but also at the language acquisition level, or the, pos the possible loss, or how we could compensate this loss, how we could find other ways to compensate the loss. And then uh, let me just uh, finish by adding that uh, as a leader, I'm currently really confronted with the challenge to support my teaching and admin staff motivation and look for a solution. Now it's, it's a long-term project, yes? It's not surviving the immediate crisis, it's about maintaining motivation, maintaining ideas, maintaining creativity to cope with a new situation. Okay, thank you very much. So let's go in the same order.
Okay, well, um, just like Sabina said, I will um, talk a little about my language center and the way we coped with the situation. I would say that um, we had the habit of working with an online environment with Moodle for a long time and probably, as Sabina mentioned concerning Swiss academics, um, I would say that language teachers and researchers have for a long time been used to uh, work with, uh, with uh, online components and to be uh, more or less to, to offer students blended learning courses. Well, that's the case at my university. And in fact, the corona crisis um, only enticed us to, um, to go more blended, to go more online. That is to say, just like uh, the, the plenary speaker, Joan Thomas Pujola, told us uh, at the beginning of this afternoon, um, when you are already working in a blended learning environment, it's much easier, of course, to go online. It's only one step further. And for the majority of cases at my university, this wasn't too difficult. Of course, the teachers have had to work a lot. Of course, we had to change certain habits and to offer different opportunities for students. But on the whole, uh, we managed quite OK and probably much better than most of the other academics who, uh, generally speaking, only offered Word document on Moodle or stuff like that. This is not the case at all in the case of language training. Uh, of course, we had to do virtual meetings with colleagues, as everybody. Uh, we had to work in teams very closely, but we did that before. And we had to redefine our training schemes, but this was not too difficult. And uh, um, I, I, I would say perhaps the only component that was a little more difficult was the redefinition of the exam um, of the exams. We had to modify that, but just like everybody here in this room, I'm sure. Okay, so we heard something about the let's say national and university level, and we are moving to European levels, how, how you have been affected. Well, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Um, perhaps before um, going into detail about some of the changes that, that we've made, um, I wanted to, to make a few sort of introductory comments. And I think the first one is that the, the impact that this crisis has had on education has actually been at the most fundamental level of that basic human right to education um, enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights, which is, of course, the cornerstone of the Council of Europe. Um, it is a, a crisis that has left vulnerable learners without access often to, to online learning or support from parents. And here, of course, I'm, I'm thinking perhaps not, not of higher education, but of younger learners. Um, and I think, sadly, that it has increased economic, social, ethnic and, and linguistic divides and in some ways polarised our societies. And it's in that climate that, that populism and extremism thrive. Um, and I think what the, the crisis has also exposed has been the fragility of our democracies. Um, and we have, an, we have a responsibility as, as educators, whichever sector we're working in, um, to use education um, to, to counter these extremist trends and, and to um, foster de uh, democracy. Um, and um, you mentioned, one of the earlier speakers mentioned this issue of qualifications, examinations. That's obviously been a huge challenge, particularly in the school sector. But I think, as the others have said, with challenges come opportunities. Um, the way we learn and the way we teach, we've had to kind of really think that and be innovative. Um, but that comes then with the question of what, what possibilities are there for professional development for all of us working in the field? Are there really good sustained opportunities um, for that development? So turning specifically to the wider Council of Europe and, and in, in particular the ECML, 
The Council of Europe, of course, is a political organization, um, and it very quickly recognized the risks to, to education um, as a result of this crisis. It has produced a political declaration, um, which should be adopted at an informal conference of committee of, of ministers of education, um, organized by the Greek presidency uh, at the end of October, and a report entitled Making the Right to Education a Reality in Times of COVID-19. And then, of course, there's the Council's ongoing work on strengthening democracy through education. I don't know how familiar you are with um, the reference framework of competences for democratic culture, um, but if you're not, it's just to say that anything I refer to in, in, in my intervention is on a slide which will be made available to everybody. That framework um, is really interesting because if you look at the competences, the values, the skills, um, and the critical understanding and knowledge, language and intercultural communication feature in every part of it. So I think we all have a responsibility to think about when we're, when we're teaching, how does this contribute? How are we helping people to become active citizens and take part in plural democratic societies? Um, and on that note, I just wanted to say there's a whole series of um, resources specifically focusing on higher education um, that you might be interested in, and they're in, in, in my slides. Um, the, we've also were working on a recommendation to the Committee of Ministers, so that's the kind of the highest level you can go, on the contribution of plurilingual education to democracy. We, we began this work before the crisis, but I think the crisis has shown us just how, how relevant it is. When it comes to the ECML, um, we developed a treasure chest of resources for parents, learners and teachers. Um, resources that were particularly adapted to homeschooling and to, to distance learning. We ran a series of online uh, webinars um, using digital tools in the language classroom. Um, and of course, there's a couple, we have an ongoing project on digital citizenship through language education. Um, and it is really looking at learners in upper secondary and at university level, um, building on the socio-actional approach of the CEFR, which I think is, is particularly relevant in this context context. Um, it's all about our professional competences where we've really been stretched in this crisis um, and our current program is, is called Changing Context, Evolving Competences. There's a guide to teacher competences for languages and education, which I think could be interesting um, to people. Um, and it's also now an offer for member states to take part in, in training activities. Um, and this is also the time, I think I mentioned the CEFR, the companion volume in my introduction. Um, we have some training in, in that field for our member states, but we're currently running two new development projects um, related to the companion volume. One led by Johan Fischer, whom I'm sure you all know well, um, and that's really looking at tools, um, a database of teaching and assessment tasks in different languages. And there's also one, a guide to linguistic mediation for primary and and secondary school teachers. So just to maybe finish by coming back to the political level, because I think that is very important. Um, we had our anniversary um, conference in December, 25 years of the ECML. And at that point, we were drafting a political declaration, the 25th anniversary declaration, raising the importance of quality language education and its contribution to democratic, peaceful societies. Um, and if you haven't seen the declaration, perhaps it's something that, that might be of interest to you because it's a tool you could use with, with managers um, to, to, to argue for the importance of language education, but also with students to talk about the different ways in which language education um, impacts on, on our society um, and how together we can foster um, democracy through, through language education. So they're just some of the, um, the, the developments at both the level of the wider Council of Europe and in particular the ECML. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Maria Teresa? Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, when we met last physically in Brussels last uh, December, we couldn't imagine. And so we, are, we were planned. Um, usually we have uh, an annual meeting um, we call conference or forum. 
it depends on the internal organization of the events. And so at the moment, we, we were implied with the, the reflections about uh, multilingualism in, uh, in our societies, but multilingualism in Africa as well. And so we had planned to have the event of the end of this uh, next December concerning, concerning this fact. So how to dialogue with, and how to analyze the difference of multilingualism in Africa and Europe. But then the coronavirus arrived, so we decided to, to postpone this uh, subject because uh, there were other urgencies, other needs. And, uh, and so we are, our, our meeting, our meeting usually as um, the meeting, the, the board meeting or the working group meetings became uh, a distance. And in this meeting, so, we decided to, um, to think about multilingualism, of course, because we are really concerned uh, with this in, uh, in the future of our education and society. So if you have a look to our website, you'll try even the call for papers about the, the subject of this year that will be imagining the future of multilingualism education and society at a turn and point. In the meanwhile, we are working in, at the moment, at three working groups, uh, which are um, concerned with uh, language and education. And so inside, there's the fact of the teaching formation, teachers formation, then, and, uh, and preparation, CLIO, uh, language language of schooling, but I think that the common theme, the common subject is uh, multilingualism in higher education. Then you can consider these aspects uh, from another point of view. So another working group is about uh, language and rights. So the where translations, where the, uh, the future of translation is going to, and we know all the difficulties that translators had during this period for the organization of their work. And this uh, subject, uh, uh, it's a subject uh, that is uh, in dialogue now with the uh, security. So you understand that multilingualism is not only, not only the fact that you have to learn many languages, but in fact, we live in multilingual societies. So this, uh, in, uh, this was uh, the, the important subject of another working group, Languages and Science, where we, we had a, a meeting in uh, a forum in Berlin two years ago about this uh, subject. Uh, but I think that we're, there's an evolution in this, uh, this field I'm, because uh, we, we saw what happened during this, uh, this month. Internationalization can't work the same, the same way. I mean, uh, for students, but not so much. And uh, anyway, the fact uh, we realized that it's important to have uh, internationalization courses in English, but we need other languages. And anyway, we need other languages to communicate to our citizen. So I think that reality has uh, composed new, a new scenery or a much more realistic one than before. So we need to, to have, um, we need to, to have a summary to have, um, to sum up all this uh, new situations or old situations, but in a new reality. So our worries uh, are uh, now, dedicated to these uh, different uh, applications of the main subject, which is uh, multilingualism in uh, higher education. And this means uh, how to, uh, which language policies to adopt in our institutions, 
or how to plan all this uh, multilingualism education in uh, in our in our institution so we have a lot to think and to work about above all to uh, to have uh, guidelines uh, to to propose to our members and our community okay uh Thank you very much. I think that uh, we have already, now we've heard the context of, of what the impact has been, and already we've had some bits of the future. So our other area what, that we would like to discuss or, or talk about is actually what we think the future will be, or what we can see at the moment, what the future can be like, and also if there are already any individual uh, I don't know, either policies or uh, uh, directions or simply activities that are already emerging at this point. So again, could we start with Sabina? Oh, I know I have to take the microphone that you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Uh, from what I know that at university, a language centers level um, in Switzerland and from what I also have learned about other European universities, Every university has to cope with national or local regulations as for the upcoming semester, as far as, as the teaching reality is concerned. This goes from teaching only online to hybrid formats to the expectation of universitarian authorities to have a dual teaching, which is perhaps too challenging and can be very um, not very satisfying, as we also heard at the keynote today. Uh, it, it goes from teaching without masks in larger classrooms to teaching with masks in perhaps not so large classrooms. It, it goes from uh, having a bigger support by IT departments or even an internal peer support system to having teachers left more uh, left alone. And it goes from being prepared like two months, knowing since two months how the semester with more may more like look like as for the framework of regulations to having to learn it in the upcoming days. So all the language center managers, all the language center teaching staff have to show an extreme flexibility and uh, to cope with the stress of yes, challenging um, being challenged by the unknown. And um, uh, we have also learned and we also see it here that the, even the more uh, solidarity and peer learning and peer support and of course also managerial support is important in that situation. This is also something we have uh, come across uh, at the coordinating committee meeting with circles where uh, all the national presidents are also uh, concerned with how what circles and what they could contribute to foster peer learning, peer support. Um, we, we are not really counting with many face-to-face -face encounters for next year or circle seminars to be organized, but we want to offer peer learning in, by uh, opening um, national associations uh, online training for their staff to other, to members of other member institutions from other national associations, by second perhaps developing also a webinar and or a peer coaching system for managers uh, at, uh, of circle national associations because they also need to learn how to manage in more digital terms or only digitally and to lead teams. So it's, it's, it's a different level also of new challenges. And um, this is a, a big concern, but um, personally, this is my personal opinion, uh, I also uh, shared the view that we can also take the chance as a chance and um, see the risks, and I'm, I'm going to add something about the risks, see the risk, not forget about the risk, but also show the openness to approach the, the new reality. Just the last point talking about the risk, of course, there is a risk we have come across within individual language centers and also which was mentioned at the coordinated committee meeting, it's the risk uh, linked to the fact that teaching staff was doing generally very well, we've mentioned that, during the um, last semester in coping with the corona situation. 
And this could lead to cuts, or this could lead to this um, conclusion, could lead authorities to the conclusion that language center staff uh, could, could make very well with less budget, with less uh, people really employed and, and paid for, for their work. It's of course linked to a total underestimation and lack of expertise was what was also the online prep or the preparation for online activities concerned. So this is a danger. Uh, and as for circles, it would really mean, apart from fostering one another, fostering peer learning, on a political level, and that's perhaps something we could also work together with our partners, we would like to come up with uh, also a statement or a memorandum which really shows the quality when it comes to la learning, language learning, language teaching, language acquisition, academic communication, the quality of different formats. Uh, the quality of online learning, uh, hybrid formats, but also the quality of face-to-face -face activities. And we don't only need political arguments or the human rights arguments, we also need, of course, some evidence uh, from, um, from uh, research when it comes to language acquisition and language learning. So uh, it's also something we could discuss within circles because we are in need of time. We have to have quick responses and quick results. Perhaps we could also have a project like, which is a more um, applied research project where we could also show uh, and show, show results from surveys we've done with students, with teachers, the impact of the different formats and the efficiency of different teaching and learning formats. That's what I wanted to <laughs> say here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Um, I, I will place myself from the uh, French level to explain a little how the situation was dealt with uh, by the universities. I think that mainly most of the universities um, help their teachers in general, not necessarily language teachers. They introduced, the IT sections of the universities introduced new tools to facilitate synchronous and asynchronous online teaching, such as Teams in my own university or Zoom in other universities. Uh, we were helped by the IT sector with webinars to explain how to use uh, Moodle in a better way or how to use Teams and so on and so on. But I would say that perhaps the most uh, efficient uh, help we had was a uh, sort of collaborative help from the colleagues in Ranacles. For example, in Ranacles, the French national organization, we decided to organize uh, sort of uh, webinars or meetings, regular meetings, every two weeks that were dedicated to specific points in language teaching where people could share uh, what they did at their own universities and uh, could uh, explain other people how to deal with such and such an aspect. And I think that in the future, this is something that will go on and that will perhaps open to other surplus members because uh, it's really a good way to progress in certain areas, not only technical areas, but pedagogical areas, of course. Um, however, uh, I appreciated Sabina's optimistic view, but since <laughs> I'm rather a pessimist, I think that unfortunately uh, there may be a sort of hidden agenda uh, from our government, at least from the French government, I'm almost sure that since language learning online seemed to happen quite well in the, 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 the last, uh, the end of uh, last year, and that uh, teachers managed to adapt and there was no major problem. I think that perhaps they think that in the future, all language courses could go online. For example, at my own university, even though we are now allowed to teach face to face, but in smaller groups, uh, this is not possible for first year students because, uh, for languages, because they are too numerous and we cannot take them all together in the same room, even with masks and 
because we don't have enough space. So uh, we decided, uh, we prepared, of course, we adapted the courses, the online courses, but we decided that we we're going to take them completely online for the first semester. And uh, the colleagues who are in charge of those courses worked a lot during the summer, all over the summer, in order to prepare courses. And I'm sure I've had uh, some of my colleagues who wrote me uh, today saying that they had started their courses with certain of some of the uh, first year students and apparently the first session everything went very well the students were very happy and so on and I think that if we show that well it works well well perhaps in the future we won't be allowed to teach face to face uh, at all, because in fact, if it works online, then why pay for buildings and for space and for rooms and so on? And then you have budget cuts, of course. Sorry to be so pessimistic. <laughs> I mentioned no. also this risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, so as we can see, definitely there are opportunities, there are big dangers. So how do you see it, Sarah? <laughs> um, yes, um, exactly. It's a bit of both, isn't it? Um, I mean, just a couple of things. Um, we we our webinars on on using digital tools were very successful, so we're going to offer more webinars between now and Christmas. Um, but we're also um, and and Circle should have received an invitation in in the last few days, and um, together with other member institutions from the Professional Network Forum, and the impulse has actually come from from Equals, and um, we're going to organise a series of online think tanks. Um, to really look at what has the impact been of this pandemic on language education and what action needs to be taken uh, to ensure a sustainable future for quality language education. And these questions that both um, 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 have, that have been raised about losing teachers, um, cutting down on buildings and doing everything online, these are going to be really important questions that, that I think we, we need to address. Um, I think it's about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, yes, we've innovated, we've adapted, we've, we've really come up with some great hybrid activities. But I think we would be all be honest in admitting that we're all exhausted as a result of it. It's been very, 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 um, you know, it's been quite stressful for people working in these conditions. Um, and just to pick up on, on what Sabina was saying, I think we lose so much if we if we accept that the face to face will, will not come back. Um, I'm thinking particularly when we um, we're in working in transnational contexts, as, as I am, um, you know, when when you have that sort of cognitive dissonance, when you come across someone whose whose culture, whose language, whose way of life, whose way of teaching is very different from your own, you need time to talk to that person. You need to have a coffee. You need to go for lunch. You need to share jokes, and gradually then you move towards a common understanding. And you can't. Do do that online. So yes, let's accept that it's had huge benefits, the fact that we've been able to do things online, but let's not fool ourselves into believing um, that real human com communication cannot, can take place only through, through an, an online environment. And I think really maybe just to come back to sort of the this idea of, of collaboration that's just been raised and, and multilateralism. You know, there have been some people in this crisis that have really called out international organizations. Let's take the, the United States um, as an example and its relationship with the World Health Organization, right? So we can go down that road or we can say this is the opportunity for more collaboration, more multilateralism and for European solidarity. That we need to share and, and learn from, from each other. Um, and, you know, I really like the title of your conference, Language Centres at a Crossroads, because crossroads, yes, dilemmas, but it also means there isn't just one road. It means there are different paths, um, and it's about sharing and learning from each other um, and exploring the different routes, because I think what the crisis has really revealed is the social, political, and linguistic inequalities. Um, they were there, they were always there, but they've been really exposed, and I think, in fact, widened um, through this crisis. So, yes, there's lots of things to be positive about, but there are serious risks and dangers, and um, we shouldn't play them down. 
Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> there is applause here <laughs> to, your, to your words. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Maria Teresa? I agree with, uh, with Sarah because, uh, in fact, our vision is the fact that uh, we have to... Sorry, uh, maybe your, uh, we can't hear you properly. Maybe the volume is a little bit down. Could you speak up no, a little sorry. bit? I, I, I was saying that I agree with Sarah because I think that we have uh, um, to study the situation because I'm quite, uh, I have an obsession about what is it, the new normal. And I follow so many uh, TV programs where they, in talk show, where they're discussing. And the last question was, how do you say, what do you think about the new normal? So I, I began to, to think about the new normal uh, I, I don't know if it will be in, in a year, in two years, but anyway, I, I think that we have to take this, this period as a chance to, as an opportunity to, um, to, to consider what can be done. Perhaps uh, we couldn't have the time to do before, but we need to do, because I see the risks. And so the risks of uh, keeping all the language courses online, for example. It can be uh, a reality, I think, that in some language center already, already is. So uh, we have to have uh, arguments to, to, to battle, to, to, to show that is not possible. I mean, which level of languages can we concrete really prepare with an online course. So I think we have to share all these experiences in order to have uh, an argumentaire, uh, a group of uh, arguments, how to, uh, a group of uh, answers, how to react to situations where there's a part of dangers, of course. So in uh, this is the, um, with these thoughts, we thought about um, we are preparing our next forum, 3 and 4 of December, uh, at distance, uh, starting from Milan, but uh, a, virtual comp a virtual forum, about uh, some challenges we have, for example, languages and education, or for the development and implementation of language policies in higher education institutions. And I think that's an important point because we have to plan more and more, not only the fact we have a, a certain number of courses to organize or for a certain number of students, but planning in the sense of uh, considering that multilingualism is a reality and we have to keep it and to organize our courses in respect of multilingualism in our societies because it's uh, the only chance we have uh, to uh, promote linguistic diversity and democracy in our, in our societies. Then there's a, a question of multilingualism in certain sectors, for example, health and, uh, and business. So it's clear that we have a language formation for research, but a language formations for reality professions in our societies. Then another challenge is the fact uh, of the, the impact of virtualization on multilingualism due to this crisis. And then the dialogues between languages and rights and citizenship in this changing world. So, I mean, it's not only a list of questions so we want to, um, to consider, but I think that we have to study all these aspects to have to be prepared for the new normal. Otherwise, I think that someone else will impose the new normal as a normal, but it's not normal if they don't respect language education. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, talking about uh, new norms and new normal and how to survive in this new world, 
Uh, maybe now we could ask uh, the audience if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to brought up or you, I don't know, experiences or something. Maybe we don't have another uh, microphone, so I can repeat it for the microphone. So if anybody would like to ask anything. Maybe uh, all of you thinking. I was just... Uh, Oh, there was? No, okay. Uh, so I'd like to ask one thing because we've heard one of the outcome of this crisis was either bigger collaboration within a nation or suggestions about collaboration across uh, centers or universities. Uh, can I ask uh, the European level <laughs> whether it is something that you can see as well, that more organizations or more... Um, areas of professions try to get together to help one another so that they somehow survive in this new reality? Or is it something that, for example, surprised you? I think there's, there's definite evidence of um, people reaching out to other organizations, similar organizations in different contexts and different countries, um, because we're all grappling with the same issues. Um, of course, contexts are, are different and that, that they raise specific um, problems or challenges, but there's an awful lot that we, that we can learn from each other. But it's really what I was saying before, it could go either way, and, and I totally agree with, with Maria Teresa, that it could go that we retreat into nationalism and we think we can solve this on our own, we've got our particular problems, we've not got time to worry about what other people are doing, and that would be really a serious mistake mistake um, because it's at times like this where coming together collaborating I mean I'm, I'm really sad not to have been been able to come and physically take part in your conference because it's not just listening in it's those informal exchanges you have with people during the course of the two or the or the three days um, and we will lose that precious um, learning, and it really is learning that takes place um, when we come together and, and we share. So um, it's not just because I work for a, a, a transnational organization. Um, I think that feel very strongly on a personal level, the need for stronger collaboration. And it needs to go, it, it, it needs to be cross-sectoral. It needs to be transnational. It needs to be um, with, with the people who are in different roles as well. Um, because um, if we continue to work in silos, um, we're actually forgetting about the learner um, because that learner starts off as a primary school child or, or even a nursery school and eventually ends up in the workplace. So they are one person moving through the sectors and therefore we need to share our experience across, uh, across sectors, across languages, across roles and across institutions and countries. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's very important. And starting from the fact of analyzing the needs of our learners, because for example, the fact of using uh, this, or, or this, this platform, that implies that we have to, to, to speak and to learn how to speak in this in this way, because we made we, we, a lot of exams like this, oral exams, written exams. But in fact, there's uh, uh, written competen written competences as well that are coming back because you have to we have to write uh, much more than other periods. So perhaps we have to reconsider the organization of our. Uh, of of our programs, for example, uh, considering the differences we have for different domains and contexts. So that's why I was speaking about uh, seriously, we have to uh, reconsider our planning of language education uh, because we have to be sure that is not our idea, it's not uh, something in, in other countries is much more used. Is our country, our language center, our university, which are the real needs uh, we, we have for the professional futures of our students uh, if, for their future um, con 
consciousness of uh, as a citizen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, there is. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. The question was uh, that we've talked a little bit about the future, which seemed to be future, but rather immediate one. And there is a question about, do we have any ideas about the long-term future that ideally or hopefully vaccine appears, everybody is vaccinated and everybody is allowed, allowed back to uh, being together. So uh, is, what do you think? Is it an idea of going back to where we were in February 2020, or what are the ideas about the future? Okay, probably, yeah. Well, I think this is a more general, even philosophical or psychological question, and on this general level, I do firmly believe that development is irreversible. It's, I mean, we, we will have changed, yes? We will have changed anyway. And uh, the point will, uh, and this is a general corona question, so you, you, you can read it all the time, yes, will, will people have changed their behavior, will they fly less, will they, okay, anyway, um, so on many levels, so, and of course, a uh, second point is, of course, I do not know what the, the, the as any, anyone, uh, what the, the future will really look like, um, but what, what I really believe in is that we should re perhaps just not ask these questions. I, I, would, I would really hope that we will have learned uh, to, to maintain the, the good experience, the good also learning and teaching experience to, and to use them to further develop our future in teaching and, and learning and that we will also be able to Yes, we have been talking about this by showing evidence, by um, by standing together to defend the good elements uh, of, for example, uh, our practice, our experience with face-to-face -face formats. So this is the challenge. The challenge will be in adapting and using experience and and show this experience and show evidence and 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 share this evidence to to contribute to a, to a new future so the i also even personally i do not even look forward to coming back to the old normal i think it's impossible <laughs> and we should rather use our energy to to find out about the new normal and how we could have an impact. Uh, there will be many restrictions, but the point will be choosing our impact and using our impact all together and also together with other mm -hmm. uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody add anything? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I wanted to add something. I totally agree with what Sabina just said. I think that in the long term, we will have been enriched by the experiences we had. I am sure that the tools that we have managed to master, such as the, uh, the video conference tools, for example, that we have added to our courses. When, when you had bl normal blended courses before, now you have blended courses with synchronous and asynchronous videos, for example. I am sure that in the future, these tools will be completely integrated into our courses and we will never think of going back to what we did in the past. In fact, I don't, I, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, our plenary speaker this afternoon insisted on the word integration, how to integrate the new tools. And I think this is really the important term to 
think about how to integrate those new tools so that they become part of our new pedagogy and they are effective. And I think this is the future. We will never go back. <laughs> okay, I could see some nodding from Teresa and Maria, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah and Maria Teresa. So, would you like to add anything, or yeah? I, if I think, well, I think that we we are living a revolution, and so we we are not prepared for revolution, but we can prepare for the post-revolution. So we can think about what we need and we can't do without. Because I can imagine that, um, uh, I don't know, the new needs in other disciplines, for example, and so inside our university, we perhaps uh, they will invent that we can learn everything, every language online. Well, let them speak. But the fact is not the others are going to, to say and propose. Then the fact in this period, we have to plan our future, our next future. So when the new normal will be there, we were, will be inside the new normal, will be the new normal, will prepare this. Because I don't know if uh, we are perhaps much more conscious than other colleagues and, and situations, because we were affected a lot of the fact that uh, learning languages without contact is, is really unnatural and so we did in uh, in this natural way but anyway we succeeded I'm sure we succeeded but in fact uh, we thanks to this experience we have to be uh, the, to prepare these guidelines and defend and promote the fact that not only we learn language we learn language and culture and and, and we are a symbol of peace for everyone. Okay, thank you. And thank you, and Sarah? Um, I mean, really just to, to, to echo um, what my colleagues have said, um, we, we don't know what the future holds, um, but this is the time to, to start planning by looking at what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, what, what are the challenges that have been exposed as a result of this crisis? And I'm kind of hoping that this, um, this series of online think tanks will help um, address some of these questions. So um, the idea is to, 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 to develop a survey um, to send out to all the, the professional network forum member institutions and for you to tell us what the particular challenges or opportunities have been. And then as a result of that, organize a, a series of, of webinars because none of us really, um, we don't know, um, we, we don't know what the future holds, but absolutely there, there is no going back. Um, and um, in some ways that's, that's positive because there, there, we've, we've learned a lot through this crisis. Um, but I would still say I do hope that some um, some face to face will will happen again because uh, it's it's irreplaceable really. Um, technology is wonderful, but but it has its limits. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a lovely idea for the end of this of this uh, panel. Uh, it, unfortunately, we don't have more time for this, but this discussion. I think that has brought uh, really interesting ideas, not only about what we've been through, but also about what we can do in the future. And I think that apart from the collaboration that has appeared and about the success of languages and about the danger of being too successful and then finally end up somewhere where we do not want to end up, I think that we should also remember the words about responsibility, about the fact that uh, we are not only working on languages and with languages, but also with citizens and future citizens, and that this complexity of the situation is not only about language teaching and learning, but about maybe all our future. So uh, thank you very much. Just one thing, uh, as Sarah said at the beginning, uh, there are links and there are, uh, well, places where to go. We will send it online together with other materials later so anybody uh, can access it. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.